Good afternoon, everybody. I think it's literally just now afternoon. Um, my name is David Plyler. I'm with the Music Division. And I'm so pleased that we have kind of a library-wide initiative here with our series, Augmented Realities, um, in which we're exploring the world of video game music, um, both old and new. So uh, we're excited to have you here um, at the, uh, where copyright's being represented uh, by Mark Gray and John Riley, John R. Riley, um, by my colleagues uh, in the Copyright Office. And I will turn it over to them and uh, hope that you consider uh, coming to some of our other events. Uh, we have a uh, event, pre-concert event tonight about the history of video game music starting at 6.30. Um, then we have a concert that features a new commission, including a new interactive game that's been designed just for this evening. Um, that's at 8 o'clock in the Coolidge Auditorium. And then we have two further talks tomorrow at 11 a.m. about the process of uh, preserving and uh, collecting video games at the library. And then a, another composer talk uh, at 2 p.m. tomorrow by Winifred Phillips, um, who will be speaking about uh, her work as a composer and just the inner, uh, what goes into putting that together, putting a video game score together. Um, she will also be selling, um, her, some of her books will be on sale at that event. Um, and we will, lastly, I should mention is that we will have uh, an arcade um, that will be uh, around for people to come out and interact with some different things, uh, with, including some uh, VR experiences. Um, that's going to be from 10 to 4 tomorrow. Um, and that'll be upstairs in Mahogany Row, level one of, the, of this building. Uh, so without further ado, thank you so much uh, to Mark and John, and I'll leave it to them. Thank you all for coming, and uh, I'd like to thank the library and the music, music division for having us today. Uh, I think this is going to be a really fun set of events for augmented realities. This is the lawyerly portion of the show, but we're, uh, we're going to keep it as fun as possible. If you have to be a government lawyer, be a government video game lawyer. I strongly recommend it. Um, my name is John Riley. This is my colleague, Mark Gray. Um, Mark is ranked in the top 10% of League of Legends players uh, in the United States, is that? In North America. In North, in America. North America. And he wanted me to mention that yes. <laughs> for, for you all here. Um, we're going we're gonna to talk today about legal issues and copyright uh, related to video games, and especially anything that's um, you know, consistent with the other themes. Anything that's related to music, we're going to insert while we can. Um, we're going to talk first about... Uh, copyright protection, then copyright registration, and then we're going to move on to things that we do a little less of around here, um, which is infringement actions and licensing. Um, to kick it off, let me tell you a little bit first about copyright protection for video games. So generally, copyright uh, protects video games in one of two or both ways, either as an audiovisual work or a computer program. and this is the copyright protection for video games, that it protects video games is not really, it's not really interesting anymore. Um, generally, protecting things under copyright, it has to be an original work of authorship that's fixed in a tangible medium of expression. And that includes, and it's not controversial, uh, things that can be viewed or perceived with a machine or a device. And this makes sense because if you have a uh, movie reel, it's using a device for a machine to play it. You might not be able to see the actual sounds and, and pictures in that, but you can use a machine. Uh, similarly, like if you have an ebook, it's not controversial that an ebook would be protected as a literary work, even though you have to view it um, using a machine. So, although video games are unique in that there are so many different types of consoles, so many types of uh, you know, PC games or games on an Apple computer, you know, the fact that they can be perceived by using a machine is not problematic anymore. So the fact that copyright can protect video games is non-controversial. Uh, that being said, there was a very famous case involving the office for not registering breakout. Uh, Atari versus Omen, and that's the former register, Ralph Omen. Um, the issue in this case was is the game Breakout copyrightable as an audiovisual work? In the early days of The Office, uh, we mostly registered works, video game works, as audiovisual works and not computer programs. But today, they can easily be both. Um, when The Office viewed this case, and here is a picture of the game as we most well know it 
you know, on the Atari, not, you know, on your phone, but on the Atari, the original version. Um, and the office looked at this and said, okay, well, let's, let's evaluate this claim. We see there is a brick wall, there is a rectangular paddle, and a little dot for a ball, and we're not gonna play the, the music, but there was four different tones during uh, gameplay. But it was basically a, a single screen, and the bricks were rainbow colored. So the copyright office says, well, of course, you, you can't copyright a rainbow. This is, this is not enough to be protected. Um, and so we rejected the work. Atari sued. And so it went up um, to be challenged. In, uh, I think, what was the judge's name? Was it just a fairly unknown judge? I think her name is Ginsburg, uh, decided this case. Um, and after declining registration, we lost. And the issue was, you know, we were looking at a single screen. And I have a still of the actual deposit, and the deposit for Breakout is this video cassette right here. This is, this is history, it was saved because of the litigation. Um, and they sent us a video, it's about seven minutes long. And when the office viewed this, and here is a, an image that the office would have seen through a CRT screen, for example, of a ball being uh, bounced around the screen. And I have to tell you, despite this not being uh, you know, important to registerability, I was watching very intently because this, they gave us a clip where the ball uh, does not die, and I was waiting for it to drop. Like Whoever was playing the original version of this game was very good at it. Um, <laughs> and I was staring in this uh, lab we have, looking very intently, perfect game. In any case, uh, the court criticized the Copyright Office for not looking at the work as a whole, including the series of different screens. So when you evaluate an audiovisual work, much like when you evaluate a movie, you don't evaluate a still from the movie, you watch it as a whole. And so in all the office's correspondence and discussing the case, it really seemed to the court like the office was forgetting to consider it as a whole, um, including the additional screens. And so this, this case was a little bit interesting because you know, it was in the early days of registering uh, video games at the office, and looking at the correspondence was kind of amusing because the uh, Atari asked us um, to submit identifying material. And so this is kind of common now, but back then they sent in the videotape instead of the game, and they sent in uh, a couple things on the next screen that are unique. But the reason they did so was, when I looked at this, I'm like, why do they say here, um, it's not practical to deposit the video game at the Copyright Office? And the reason is, when they were originally registering Atari, they were registering the cabinet version, right? If you're gonna play in an, in an arcade, not the Atari 2600 version that you plug into your home console. So that's why they had this uh, registration where they asked for you know, materials other than the original deposit. So, what they actually sent us on the left there is a picture of all the, the different components of the game, which I don't know if you know this, but the Copyright Office can't just look at circuits and tell you that this is copyrightable. So I, we don't know why they sent this in. Um, apparently the breakout game is not a software game, it's a hardware game, so that's probably why. But in our research we couldn't actually figure out why. We don't typically get uh, pictures of circuits as part of the registration. But we do typically get the other item that's here, uh, which is a synopsis of, of gameplay. And that's a little interesting because isn't Breakout just a ball bouncing on a screen? When we get into it a little bit, and Mark's gonna talk a little bit more about deposits, the stories are a little bit more interesting. Mario goes on an adventure. This one is literally, a, the player, they did a great job making this a very extended description. The player commands a paddle, which is movable, and it's it's a bouncing ball. It's vertical pong, as we call it. It's not it's not doesn't need that long of a description. Uh, in any case, I did want to add, just doing some research for this. Breakout is kind of a historically interesting game, and here's our first moment of audience participation. Do you know who first was asked to develop Breakout at Atari? 
That's right, Steve Jobs was asked to, to create Breakout for Atari, and here is, I uh, can't confirm this is official copyright office lore, but here's the story that, that, that I've uh, read in bits and pieces. Apparently he asked uh, Wozniak to build it for him because he didn't, he didn't have the time or didn't want to, and he knew Woz could get it done in a few days, which he did, um, and that's just kind of, uh, apparently the, that was version one of Breakout, which is not the, the version that we know now, but I just think that's kind of a uh, hilarious lore for the Breakout game. In any case, um, that's my first part here. I'm gonna hand it off to Mark, and Mark's gonna a little bit, talk a little bit more about what we actually do get for deposits at the office. Thank you very much, John. Yes, so I have the exciting task of walking you through uh, how you actually register your copyright once you have your game and you're ready to go. Um, and so if you're wondering, you know, video games are a little complicated, how do you register a copyright in a video game? The answer is the same way you register anything else. We have this lovely website um, where you can go and you can register your copyright online. Um, there's a standard form and then there's special forms. This is just standard. We, we know how to handle video games these days. So if I was going to register my hypothetical video game, which definitely exists, um, I would go into the website and I would be asked a series of questions to describe what is my game, what did I do, you know, who made it, who owns it, all of that fun stuff. Um, and one of the first questions I'm going to be asked is, what is the type of work? So John mentioned uh, video games can be audiovisual works, they can also be literary works if you're claiming the source code. Um, the, we recommend people pick whatever is more predominant, what is, what is the larger portion of it or uh, the way you conceive of it. Um, and so I will go down here and I will pick, well, in, in my case, I've decided mine is an audiovisual work. It's got great graphics and sounds that I cannot display for you today, but it definitely does exist. Um, and so after I fill that out, I'll fill out the title, um, and I'll be asked who created this, in this case, me. Um, and so because I've registered this as an audiovisual work, we have a series of questions for people that create audiovisual works. Usually, they tend to be people registering motion pictures and movies, um, and so you'll see there in the top right, um, usually you will figure out, you know, did you, write the, did you make the whole movie? Did you just work on the production, the cinematography? Um, because mine is a video game, those really aren't relevant. Um, so I've filled in here that this is audiovisual material. That is my contribution to the work, is that I've made all of the audiovisual material. Um, and so once you fill out the, the name, the type of work, the person who made it, and then the person who owns it in case I've you know, given it to someone or sold it or, or whatever, um, you will also be asked, is there anything else we should know? Um, is there anything, for example, in this game that you did not originally create? Uh, so in some cases, uh, that if you think about a game such as Grand Theft Auto, when you're driving a car, there's radio that you can play in the background, there will be songs on the radio that are just normal songs you would hear on the radio. Obviously, Rockstar didn't make those songs, they licensed them, and so uh, you would go into the material excluded and you would say, well, there's pre-existing music in my game. Same thing for something like Rock Band or Guitar Hero. They didn't make those songs, but they might have made the game and some of the graphics that go along with them. Um, so when you're going through and you're adding, what are the additional things that you should know about my game, you will have to let us know what did you not actually make, what is not actually within the game copyright that you have created. And so that's sort of filling out all the information in the forms. The very last piece is the really exciting piece uh, where you actually get to send us a deposit of a, a copy of what you've made. Um, so for some types of works like books, you will just send us the book. Um, for video games, as John mentioned, uh, now we request identifying material. We just need to see enough of the game, enough of the audiovisual work, or enough of the literary work to know that it is copyrightable. And so I'd like to show you a few examples of things you may have heard of. Um, so if any of you are familiar with The Legend of Zelda, we have the registration deposit for The Legend of Zelda. They gave us both a copy of the packaging, the artwork on the packaging, um, just as a, as a JPEG, as an image, um, and they also submitted the first and last 25 pages of all of the source code. I'm not going to give you that because that is theirs, um, but I, I have included two snippets here, so you'll see at the very beginning they include graphics, very important for an audiovisual work is to have graphics, um, and they also uh, set up some of the initial variers, uh, variables and parameters for the game, so they've got lens flare, the dungeons have cameras, the world has shadows, those are all really good things to have in a game, um, but this is what we're going to see when somebody actually registers the work is we're going to get a deposit, um, usually of the source code as well as some of the audiovisual materials. So moving on, we've got the latest Mario game, Super Mario Odyssey for the Nintendo Switch. Um, this registration came in as an audiovisual work as well. So what did we get? Well, we got a very long video that I cannot display for you because it is 20 minutes. Um, and we also got the synopsis and the summary there in the bottom left. So they say the 
company video recording is submitted for identification, so it's identifying material, and they provide a nice little synopsis. Mario travels across many locations in different kingdoms. Um, and so this is, what we're, this is what we get when we get registrations nowadays. This will usually be uploaded online, sometimes will be sent to DVD. So we got gameplay for The Legend of Zelda. That was on a DVD. That's currently in the library's collection, so I don't have it for you here today. Um, but this is the kind of things that we're seeing. And so this video clip actually was just sort of a, a bunch of different excerpts. So it had the opening kind of uh, the opening cut scene of the game and sort of snippets of gameplay. And then the, on bottom right, you see the credits. So they've got kind of different pieces of the game. So you know sort of the whole, like a, a kind of a whole sample of it. Um, and that's what we're going to be looking at. So then we have Pokemon, the latest Pokemon game from the Nintendo Switch, Let's Go Pikachu. You've got um, uh, an excerpt of after you've beaten the first gym with Brock, because you've, you've gotten the Boulder Badge, and that's great for you. Um, there's an excerpt of a game battle. You'll see Pikachu's wearing a nice hat and jacket. Um, Eevee only has the hat. I'm sure Eevee's very sad. Um, and then in the bottom left, that's also a snippet of the opening cutscene. And then on the right, um, you may have heard in the last year or so of a game called Red Dead Redemption 2. It's kind of a Western open world type game. Uh, that was registered as a literary work, um, and so they gave us the source code. And so you'll see here in the top right some of the initial opening source code, and then there are very clean comments. So someone is is focused on making sure that you understand what the code does. So I've excerpted that here because I thought it was kind of cool. It's good programming practice for those of you who are programmers. Um, and then last but not least, um, because video games are a little bit interesting because of their hybrid nature, uh, we sometimes have issues that are specific to registering video games that you might not see in other contexts. And so one of the issues we'll see is because you were picking, is this an audiovisual work or is this a literary work, uh, sometimes people will choose one of those and not give us that as a deposit. So they'll say, I've registered an audiovisual work, and then they will give us 50 pages of source code. And we can't compile 50 isolated pages of source code, unfortunately. Uh, so we actually will, uh, will ask them, could you give us a deposit that shows the audiovisual stuff, the sounds and the music and, and the, the animations and all of that. Um, sometimes we will get two applications, one for the source code, one for the actual audiovisual game. Uh, we tend to not accept those because um, usually when a studio develops a game, everything is owned by the developer. Um, and so those aren't actually separate copyrighted works. It's one integrated work, and so we only need one application. Sometimes we have to remind people of that because it's a little hard to remember that. Um, other times we will get different registrations for maybe the PlayStation 4, and then we'll get a Nintendo Switch version. Um, uh, again, I mean, the audio-visual work, if you think about you know, a, a game like, uh, like Red Dead or God of War or something, uh, well, not God of War because it's exclusive, but if you think about sort of the average game, the way it appears and sounds and is displayed to you on a different platform is going to be basically the same, right? Right? Like whether it's on a PlayStation or an, or an Xbox, it's still the game. Um, and so we treat those as, again, one unitary work. There might be some interoperability code that helps it run on a particular platform, but it's the same game. It's largely the same code base. Um, and so again, like if we get a registration for the PlayStation 4 version of something, we don't actually need a separate registration and a separate fee uh, for the game in a different platform. And so sometimes we have to remind people of that. Last but not least. It is, it is not always easy to remember every bit of pre-existing copyrighted material in your game. Games get really big, they've got a lot of music, they've got soundtracks, they might have assets. Um, and so sometimes people will forget to disclaim pre-existing copyrighted material and we have to have a dialogue back and forth with them. So those are some of the common issues that we have. Um, but I would much rather hear John jam out to some music. And so I hope you can talk to us about music licensing. Great, thanks Mark. And just if you have any questions about registering a work, um, our compendium is a great guide for that. So it's on our website. We are updating it periodically. Um, and if you need to register your game, please check that out. Can I ask a sure, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> That is a good question. I think we have the same problem with uh, different, for example, blogs and other types of website. We do have rules pending for those types of literary works. I don't know of anything that's pending for video games that are constantly update, updating, but that's kind of a known problem in the copyright world. Um, but we can talk to Rob <laughs> and see if he can help you out. Rob is the head of our registration division. But yes, that is a good question from Ben Golan from ESA, the Entertainment Software Association. <laughs> All right, let's talk a little bit more about music. I'm gonna take my video game uh, lawyer hat off. I'm gonna put my government music lawyer hat on, and we're gonna talk about music licensing. Uh, under the copyright law, there are two different types of works when we talk about uh, music. 
that's the musical work or the composition uh, or the sound recording, which is the recorded uh, audio file. So if you're licensing works to be in a video game, um, especially important if it's a pre-existing work, you're gonna have to license both works. When you're licensing um, you know, a composer's work, typically that's easy to do because they own both and it's licensed at the same time. Um, but you do have to get both of these works to be able to put music into your game. Um, and not just the works, but the right types of rights. And usually uh, video game companies ask for all of the rights, uh, but depending on, as kind of a theme with music licensing, the different licenses depend on the different parties and their relative strength. Um, also, occasionally, sometimes arcade game owners, or arcade owners, which is kind of less of a common thing now, uh, would get public performance licenses for you know those games that do play music. Think of like Dance Dance Revolution or, or a game like that that might play audible music in a public space. They would need to get a license for the musical work, and that has it is not as prevalent as some other types of licensing, but that has happened in the past. So, we're going to talk about different kinds of music, including pre-existing songs, including that in a video game, as well as compositions for video games um, to license these works. You, and this is all from, from music law treatises, uh, so I don't know any of this personally. Um, generally, the two ways to do this are licensing for a flat fee, which could range on average between $2,500 and $20,000. Um, typically, royalty-based licenses, so you get, for example, a few cents every time the game is sold, um, range much less, 19, uh, 9 cents to 18 cents per copy per song. So that may depend, though, on the type of game, right? So if you have a game like Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, it was very notable for having great music on it. And uh, the original version of it had, for example, a band that a lot of people hadn't heard yet, Goldfinger, but they rose in popularity greatly after the game came out. So it might be worth uh, a lot more to the band to be featured in a, in a video game if they're just starting out and the price would be much less. Um, other works, uh, for example, the game I grew up on, uh, John Madden Football, they use other works as a uh, soundtrack is the same as Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, but those songs were kind of altered, you know, maybe taking out swear words and replacing a lot of the lyrics with football-based lyrics, which is interesting. Um, so that might require a different, maybe even a, a larger fee if you have to re-record things. For something like DJ Hero, where you're not just playing the song in the background, but it's featured in the game as a part of the game, and also you're remixing it, that might require you to pay a a greater fee because the music is the feature of the game. And then finally, that's a Spice Girls game. Um, occasionally, video games get made featuring musicians. I think there's one for uh, 50 Cent. Uh, the Def Jam artists have one as well. Um, if your music is featured in the game and it's a game about you, obviously you're likely to demand a higher <laughs> price. But of course, other types of uses, uh, term, um, you know, the platform, the territory, those kind of things can affect licensing for music. Similarly, um, you can have, as we are going to uh, hear from some of our composers later in, the, in this uh, series, you can compose for video games. These are typically very similar to uh, the license or similar to audiovisual licenses for like movies. Um, you would generally have a license that is a work made for hire, which means the owner of the video game would be the owner of the composition in most cases. Um, and the fee could be substantial for star composers. I've seen a lot of uh, kind of established composers might get $100,000 or upward, but I've actually heard of one case where a composer for video game music got $1.5 million. Um, but that's to say, if you're just starting out, you you may get paid not by the completion of the whole score, but for you know a track in it, and that might be as low as a thousand dollars per minute, for example. So the fees, like everything else in the world, uh, can be adjustable. Um, you might be able to get some additional fees for new uses, new devices. I'm sorry, I'm just really curious. What video game did the composer get paid from? Yes, John. It, the music treatise did not say. <laughs> But it's, 
It, uh, Jeff or Todd Brabeck are the ones to ask, though. The, Bra the Brabeck music treatise is where it says. I think it was either that. It was either that or the Cone one. And it, we did a, we did some research, but I will admit this is not. You know, the Copyright Office does not license works like this. Um, but we thought it would be important to include a little bit of the, the music world in our video game talk. Um, and the people you might want to talk to are the other composers um, who are going to be you know, speaking later in this event. Um, and we're actually it's very excited to have Austin Wintry and Winifred Phillips um, talking. And I, I do have to point out that these games here, uh, authored, the compositions authored by them both, both have been award-winning, and in fact, Journey uh, was nominated for a Grammy, which is pretty exciting. Um, so if you do have time to go see those, uh, please do. Is that a, a question? So that's a good question. Um, copyright is territorial, as is licensing. So the, most countries we have copyright treaties with where we have protection for our songs and their songs. So if they have copyright protection of their song, we couldn't just use it in you know, a video game here without licensing it um, because copyright attaches at creation, not registration. Um, there's only a handful of countries that we don't have copyright relations with. But then you know, your, your other question is, you know, if I have a song that is restricted by territory, maybe the video game does actually account for that. So frequently, video games will be re-released in other countries using different soundtracks. So for a game like, like Journey, that might not make sense because Journey does not have specific lyrics that are geared towards one uh, country or another. But for a game like Madden Football or uh, you know, the skateboarding game, uh, they might use local music <laughs> in their soundtracks in different countries, and frequently do. So that's why you know, if you negotiate a license, uh, let's say you put in out a game, you, might, you always need to ask what territory I'm going to have this in, because if you use it for a worldwide license, um, then it's going to be different than for United States or North America only, for example. But that's a good question. All right, so the kind of interesting thing that's been happening with video game music is its value has really increased, and the uses uh, have kind of diversified a lot since, you know, Breakout came out, and there's four tones. Just you're never going to have uh, those four beeps be memorable. But as times progressed, everybody, many people, um, if I said I am underground now, people know I'm talking about Super Mario Brothers, even though that that's not the name of the song. It's just everybody can recognize that, and as time has gone on, there's been more of a market for, you know, the musical works in video games. And so some examples here, they've released soundtracks for Journey and Flower. Um, they've actually, the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater game is, is a good example because they released the songs that, you know, pop punk music um, as a CD. Uh, they've also kind of released the the traditional games like Donkey Kong and Mario World as a soundtrack for different levels if you're interested in that. And I think more the most interesting one is Street Fighter because they released a CD of just the uh, the gameplay you know, sound, sounds, not just the songs, just the, the sounds that are played. For example, when someone gets punched or thrown or the level's over. So I find that very interesting. Especially interesting is, you know, I have friends who like to do metal covers of 8-bit songs, but there's also symphonic covers of, you know, these some of these uh, Journey especially. Um, and I think that's, that's really great, and people are coming out, you know, hugely to see these. Um, that being said, if we're talking about music getting licensed in video games, I thought it would be interesting to uh, show you the fact that the reverse also happens. We have video game sounds in popular music. And so I'm going to give you a few examples, and this is part two of the audience participation version. Um, so I'm going to play the track of the popular song and then the track of the original sound. And if anybody could tell me where it comes from, they will get easier over the three. Um, 
we'll, we'll see if anybody can guess. All right, so I hope this isn't too loud, but I got my man on the, on the uh, sliders to tell. All right, here's the first one. This is Drake's Six God. I'll admit it, I'll admit it. You haven't been to man for like a minute. I told you that I'm in it for the long haul. You can really get the business. I'll admit it, I'll admit it. All right, so here's the original place where it came from. It's not Castlevania. It is Donkey Kong Country 2. This is Haunted Chase from Donkey Kong. And so I played this for my, for my colleague, and he's like, that's not the same song. And here's the producer of that track saying, yes, we took the sample from Donkey Kong Country 2. So I think that's really good. All right. Song number two. You didn't know there was going to be kind of a participation here, but here we go. This is, this is Dram's Cha-Cha. I like to cha-cha. And a Latin bar, yeah. With a Dominican and And here is where the sample was from. It's this one's a lot easier to hear. It is Super Mario, yeah, that is correct. Super Mario World, this is Star World theme. So th this one was actually a little bit interesting and I don't know any personal history about this, but this is, the Dram version was the original version. They have re-released this song with a slightly edited beat to it. And maybe you ask yourself, why did they do that? Maybe there was a licensing issue. I have no personal knowledge of this. All right, last one, Kanye West. This is, uh, Kanye West song, Facts, the Charlie Heat version of Facts. Perfect. Yeezy, 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 just jumped over, jump me. Yeezy, 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 just jumped over, jump me. Yeezy, 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 I feel so accomplished. All right, did anybody pick up the actual takeaways from the video games? I got a man in the back. We're going to play him. We're gonna play them individually because that one, it's, it's not the beat that's used, but it's these two sounds. Perfect. And here's the second one. You. My man in the back, you got it? Street Fighter II. Street yeah. Fighter II. <laughs> right, so this, this actually brings up a pretty interesting trademark question because Kanye is using that perfect sound as kind of his producer tag. Uh, not my copyright world, but that's, it poses interesting questions. Are there any issues with that? All right, so turning back to putting on our video game hats and less of the music hats, I'm going to turn it back to Mark. He's going to talk about a couple of interesting infringement cases for you. Thank you. Thank you, John. We're actually going to go a little bit back in time for this next one and not as much uh, current uh, hip-hop music. Um, but I have three cases I want to talk through with you because a lot of times figuring out sort of what is a video game copyright, how, what does it cover and what does it not cover, the way you can figure that out is by actually looking at cases where someone says, you infringed my copyright, you've taken my game. Uh, so I have two very old school games I would like to talk about and then one a little bit more modern. Um, so this first case is, you probably recognize on the left, that's Pac-Man. Um, does anyone recognize the game on the right? Yeah, it's, there's a historical reason for that. Um, so the, the game on the right is a game called Casey Munchkin. Um, when Pac-Man was popular back in the day, this actually, this was a case that was a few years before we got sued for not registering Breakout. Um, Atari built Pac-Man for the arcades, and so there was a, a guy who was a programmer who actually made games um, as an independent contractor, and he was going through an airport, and he found an airport arcade. I have never been alive when airport arcades were a thing, to my knowledge. Um, apparently, that is something you could do in the airport while passing time. Um, and so he found this uh, arcade Pac-Man in an airport and thought, this is really cool. Wouldn't it be really cool if there was a home video game console version of this? So he goes back home, and he starts working on this game. 
And originally, the idea between him and, um, and a guy from the company, North America Phillips, Consumer Electronics Corporation, uh, their idea was they were going to build this game, and they were going to go to the people at Atari and ask for a license, and then this would be a home version of Pac-Man, and they were going to make a ton of money. Um, Atari was not interested in letting them put the Pac-Man name on their game, so they decided that they were actually going to rejigger the game a little bit more and release it on their own for home consoles. And so if you look at the difference between these two games, um, you'll notice the Casey Munchkin game on the right, it's a little bit more um, horizontal and it's kind of a landscape orientation because instead of being on a square arcade cabinet screen, it's meant to be on a home CRT. Uh, you'll see the, you know, the, uh, the main character is not a yellow little pizza slice, it's a blue less pizza slice, and then the, the little enemies look a little bit more like squids with tentacles than they do ghosts. Um, so there are a number of differences between the two games. Um, and particularly the, uh, in Pac-Man, there's actually dots all over the screen, and there's only 12 dots in the uh, Munchkin version of this game. Um, and so they release this game for home consoles, Atari promptly sues them, um, and the court had to figure out, you know, what does the copyright in this game cover, and are these games similar enough to be infringing? Um, and this case actually it got, it got they, there was a lawsuit, and then they actually appealed, um, and so this was an appellate decision, which was the final decision in this case. And so it's interesting, because the court looks at these two games, and they look at Pac-Man, and both sides agreed, unlike with Breakout, that there was a valid copyright here. They're, they weren't really sure about what it covered, but something in Pac-Man is copyrightable, we don't really know what. Um, and so the judges were looking at this game, and they actually say at the outset, Pac-Man is primarily an unprotectable game. A lot of what you're seeing in Pac-Man is not actually copyrighted expression, it is part of the game. And so what do they describe Pac-Man as? They say, well, it's a maze chase game. So you go around and you score points because you have your little player character and you're going through the maze um, and you're trying to avoid the ghosts, um, but at some points in the game, you were able to eat the ghosts instead of them eating you and killing you. Um, and so a lot of the elements of the map and the scoring table and the fact that there are tunnels and you'll, you'll if you've played Pac-Man, which I hope many of you have, like it, you know, you loop around from that little middle, middle passageway. If you go out on the left, you pop out on the right. All of those things are gameplay elements, and all of these things are not part of the, the copyright claim. Um, but taking all of those away um, and looking at what's left, what the court did see is, is that there was a valid copyright in what they called the Pac-Man characters. So, uh, and the, the court actually keeps describing the Pac-Man as a gobbler. He's a gobbler character, which is great. Um, and so looking at it, the court says, well, there, you know, you may have, in order to make a maze chase game like this, you have to have a maze with passageways and enemies to avoid and some sort of pathing and scoring system. But you don't have to have these very similar looking ghosts as the enemies. And you don't have to have a strange circle with a V-shaped mouth who kind of animates in a, monch in a chomping motion as he walks around. And so looking at those elements, they said, well, because you decided to use the same kind of main similar Pac-Man gobbler character, and because the, the uh, enemies in the Munchkin game have a similar eye and leg movement that was very peculiar, um, what was left that was not dictated by the gameplay was protected and it was infringed. So in this case, the game was found infringing, they were no longer allowed to sell it, and as we've seen here today, nobody actually remembers the name of poor Casey Munchkin. Um, so that was a case where they found infringement based on sort of non-gameplay elements. Um, in the next example, this was actually a year earlier, um, there was a lawsuit over the Asteroids game, another Atari classic. Um, and so here, you know, there's a lot of similarities. You know, you've got a little kind of a mouse cursor ship. There's little uh, asteroid rocks scattered around the screen, uh, dark background, scoring. The, the score numbers are sort of in the same place on the screen. Um, and in this case, uh, there, there's a similar level of analysis, sort of like what here is dictated by gameplay, what here is dictated by non-gameplay. Um, and so the court made a very, very, very long list of every way these games are similar. Um, and so it's, um, you know, the ship size, the rocks, the fact that there are different sizes of rocks, they break up when you shoot them, there's kind of a, a, a velocity, uh, there's a sort of a velocity element to the gameplay where when you're engaging the thrusters, you will accelerate and then you will slowly decelerate when you stop pressing it. Um, but looking at that, the court said, well, all of these similarities are inevitable because the, if you're going to make a game about a spaceship going through all of these space rocks, given what video games are capable of now, you would have to do most of these things. You would have to have, um, you know, you'd want to have a scoring system, you'd want to have rocks that move in different directions at different speeds, all of these kinds of things. And so if you take all of that away, 
and you only look at what's left, uh, most of what's left is different. So the game, well, the, the game on the right called Meteors is in color. Um, it actually, if you played it, so sort of going back to the breakout thing, when like looking at screenshots, they may look pretty similar, but when you're playing, the pace of like acceleration, rock movement, um, shooting the rocks and the missile speed, all of those things actually played out very differently. And so the court said here, you know, someone playing these games would actually find them to be very aesthetically different. Um, and sort of what is overlapping here is all based on the elements of the gameplay. And so here there was no infringement and meteors, while perhaps not as recognizable as asteroids, was um, allowed to continue going on and being in the marketplace. Um, so those are two very kind of old games back from the early 80s. Uh, breaking it a little bit more modern, 40 years later, uh, perhaps you've heard of a game called Fortnite. I imagine given this panel, most people have heard of this game maybe in the news, maybe they've played it. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Fortnite is uh, what is called a Battle Royale style game. So if you've ever watched the Japanese movie Battle Royale, great movie, it's that as a game. If you haven't watched that movie and you think of Hunger Games, very similar to that. Um, so essentially, uh, a large group of players is dropped onto this map here on the right, um, and you'll be dropped off in a subset of the map, and as time expires, the map will get smaller and smaller, and if you're outside of it, not good to be there. Um, and the idea is that you're sort of having a last man standing battle um, where the map keeps getting smaller and more constrained so that you're forced to fight each other and, and be the last person to the last team standing. Um, Fortnite, like many modern games, is not a game you pay to download. It is a game that is free to download and then you pay for various cosmetics items. So if you look at the, the image on the right with the plane, you've got a, a woman in a onesie. There's a guy in the bottom right who looks like he's kind of like a like a, maybe like a, a Bigfoot or like an Arctic monster snowman. You've got the guy in the ski gear. There's a samurai on the top of the, of the plane tail. And so all of these are cosmetics that you can purchase either using um, real money or an in-game currency that is purchased with real money. Um, and in case you think that selling, selling your game for free is not a lucrative business model, it is reported that in 2018, uh, the developers of Fortnite made eight, uh, $3 billion in profit. That is billion with a B, and that is profit with a P. It is a lot of money. Um, one of the cosmetic things that you can get in this game, separate from your, you know, your animal onesie or your ninja outfit, is that you can uh, download what are, or you can um, get what are called emotes, which are sort of like short moves, animations, uh, dances. Uh, this has sparked a number of lawsuits in the last few months. And so, and what is now my favorite slide of this presentation, uh, just you know, get in your seats, get ready, is what I call a gif explosion. Um, all of these dance moves here um, are are or have been subject to active litigation um, in the last six months, I would say. Um, so on the top right, or in the top left, we're gonna start with the top left and move around. Uh, the top left, that is Alfonso Ribeiro. He is the actor for Carlton and the French Prince of Bel-Air. That is the Carlton Dance. That is a game that you can uh, purchase in the Fortnite game. It is also a dance that he is very well known for, for doing. Um, in the top right, uh, his the, the kid's name is, is Backpack Kid. You'll see he's wearing a backpack. He actually, rose to prominence when he performed on SNL, but he was big on Instagram before that. Um, that is a dance move called The Floss. Uh, he also has filed a lawsuit against Epic Games. On the bottom left, uh, uh, he's a minor, so his name isn't public, but his, uh, his nickname is uh, Orange Shirt Kid because he's a kid wearing an orange shirt. Um, so, uh, you know, Fortnite's been going on for a few years now. It's been big for a few years, and so one of the things they did last year is they had a, a competition where you could upload clips of yourself doing a dance move, and whoever won the competition, I think they called it, um, the boogie down contest. Uh, if you won the competition, your, your dance would be featured as one of these emotes in the game. So he submitted this video of him. Um, that is now a dance move, as you can see on the left. Um, and so he also filed a copyright claim based on the dance move on that. And then on the right, uh, these are two young men, uh, Jalen Brantley and Jared Nickens, uh, former football players at the University of Maryland, I believe, doing uh, uh, the Running Man. They sparked the Running Man challenge. They were on Ellen. Um, and that is the dance version of that in the game on the left. Um, so all of these uh, dance moves have been um, subject to litigation in the last few months. And the, 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 the question is, is whether these being in the game, not as part of the gameplay, but as purely sort of a cosmetic aesthetic piece of the game, um, does this infringe copyright? I'm not gonna answer that question for you because this is all active litigation and that is not something I'm able to comment on right now. Um, but I will note, um, at least in the top left, uh, we did reject the application for the Carlton dance. 
Um, we, so just as a side note, as I mentioned, so when we get deposits, we're usually getting sort of a, like a full copy of like a book or a movie or something, or we're getting identifying material. We are not getting these GIFs. We're not getting GIF side-by-sides. We're not getting like a two-second video. Um, so we are getting different material in deposit that we're then evaluating and deciding if there's a claim there or not. Um, in this case, we got, a, I think, a short video clip. Um, the, the rejection letter is public and it's online. It's been reported on. You're welcome to read it. It's very long. I'm not going to read it here. Um, but this is kind of a non-gameplay issue that you're seeing now where the question is, you know, choreography under the Copyright Act is protectable, uh, short dance moves, uh, simple routines are not, um, and the question is where do these fall on that line and is putting them in this video game infringing or not? That is not a question I will answer, but it's something very interesting to ponder. And so on that note, I think that brings us to a close. Yeah, so does anybody have any questions you didn't already ask, including none about Fortnite? <laughs> <laughs> Only Fortnite so, questions. So, Let's say one person creates a work and for a civic console or something like that. 20 years later, with a new console, they just update the graphics, but everything kind of is the same. Do they receive a new copyright? Or is this, um, is this updated, this copyright? Or take it. would that prior Go copyright ahead. expire in, in the accordance to the uh, So the you, um, so if you remember when I was talking about registration, uh, one of the sections you have is where you disclaim something that isn't new to the registration. Uh, if you're updating the graphics, for example, um, it kind of depends on really what you're updating and what you deposited, but you know, say you're taking, for example, uh, the Nintendo is remaking Legend of Zelda on the Switch, it's gonna be a 3D game instead of a 2D game. They are changing sort of the visual and probably the audio and the sound record, the sound, the sound effects in that game as well. But a lot of the mechanics and story and text is probably gonna be the same. Um, so you would probably treat that as a separate registration and you would say, well, we already have this old, um, you know, Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening registration, here it is. Um, what we are claiming is this new piece. We're claiming the, the new audiovisual elements, the sound effects, the new graphics, any new computer code. Um, and so that would be sort of a, a new layer on top of that, but you would disclaim kind of the original thing, because the original game is out and it's been out and it's subject to its own um, conditions and expirations and term and all that. That's in, in the copyright world, something we call a derivative work. Yes. So you only get copyright in what we call the delta, the difference between the original and the new. And that difference has to be protected by copyright. You can't just have a new hat and get a new copyright. It has to be substantial enough to be protected on its own. Um, a lot of people are streaming video games. And would you have to license the video game in order to do a stream and have millions of people watch you play the game? So that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you're licensing a, if you're streaming a protected work, uh, something that's got protected by copyright, yes, generally if you're publicly performing, if you're publicly displaying uh, a work, those are rights of the copyright owner. You know, I can conceive of certain situations where the stream is not public. If you're streaming to a friend, for example, maybe that's private. But generally, yes, you should get licenses. And we're the copyright office. We're going to tell you, you know, maybe some circumstances might be different, but generally you would need a license for that. Or, or some sort of legal arrangement where they let you do that. Yes. It's not a problem. So, what did that oh, ask? so if a game or even music is created by deep learning neural networks, would that be something that the owner of the AI program would be copyright for? Office. You've been on copyright Twitter lately, huh? Yes. <laughs> that is a question subject to much debate in the academic community, but I don't believe we have a position on that, do we? So, generally, I don't think there is any latest <laughs> yeah. from the office, um, but for the public here, just so you know, copyright has to be created by a human author. If you saw in the news maybe a couple of years ago, the monkey selfie, the monkey did not get a copyright. We did not register the work because the monkey is not a human author. So the question is, at what point does artificial intelligence, something that's programmed by humans, uh, turn into something that's actually created by a machine? Because of course, you know, if I uh, draw something on my computer, I use the computer to make the digital drawing, that we would never say that that was created by a machine. But when the machines start uh, introducing logic and, you know, arguably, the further afield you get from it being an extension of the author, the human, 
it does come into some hypothetical interesting questions that I don't think the copyright world or the copyright office has resolved that dividing point yet. Uh, yes? I have two questions. My first one is on streaming up. Since I'm a better streamer myself, um, I know recently there's been a lot of uh, lawsuits out against certain streamers for music. Mm. Um, not as part of the game, but it's just like separate music. But I haven't really seen any uh, copyright lawsuits or heard of any against the person, like the actual game from the video game company itself. I was wondering if you did, like, if you got, like, if you might have a perspective as to why that is. You know, we don't, as a part of the Copyright Office, we actually don't even go to court ourselves. We get the Department of Justice to do that. I think you might need to ask a, a uh, practicing uh, attorney, like a private attorney. Um, you know, generally, the strategies for enforcing rights is basically up to the copyright owner. Um, in some cases, it makes sense to go after services. In some cases, it might be important to go after a particular individual. It really kind of depends, and I, I'm sorry, I just don't know the answer to that. But you had two questions. Yeah, so. So I had some guesses on that one, actually, John. As a young person who is interested in once again, what is your suggestion or your advice that you could pass on to anybody here that would think of getting involved in copyright? Getting involved in copyright? Yeah, but like specifically with the games. Ooh, uh, that's a good question. That's a good question, John. Um, I would say, you know, coming to this is a great start, frankly. <laughs> reading, reading books, uh, and, and I know one of the composers who speaks later is going to be is putting out a, has a fantastic book on composing uh, music for video games. Um, I might also introduce you to the fellow two in front of you, Ben Gallant. He might have some ideas. I, I would say you can roll into it. Right. Ooh, that's that's a dangerous hat to put on as a government official. Um, so one thing that's important, and I, yes, and just you know this, but yes, as before you get started, is there is a distinction in the copyright world between the idea and the expression of an idea. So an idea under copyright cannot be protected. So you can't say I made a maze game. You can't make a maze game. Um, but the expression of that idea, and here. Yes, it, it, it does seem a little odd to me because these games I could see are different. There's enough differences in the court walk and, and Mark walked us yes. through it. I had some other questions on this one because this just seems like it's in color, but maybe Mark has some other other thoughts. Well, I yes, yeah, so I, I, have a, I have a few thoughts. These, these cases are, are interesting uh, different sides of a coin. Um, so one of the, the common debates you see in the copyright space is where is the line between an idea and an expression and sort of what is an idea? Because depending on how you define an idea, if the idea is just a video game, then maybe a video game about spaceships shooting asteroids where the asteroids have three colors and the, and the spaceship shoots a tiny little pixel dot um, is enough of an expression to be easily infringed. If you define the idea as a spaceship game where you are scoring points and shooting space rocks, um, it, it sort of changes the analysis. And so the, the court here, um, that was the way they defined the idea, is the idea of a game where you are a spaceship shooting space rocks. Um, I, I think maybe a different way to look at this is to sort of say, um, what is, and a variation of that is, what is dictated by the gameplay and what is not? And so in the, um, in the Pac-Man example, I mean, remember, the court said, this is mostly an unprotectable game. Most of what you were seeing here in Pac-Man is not protectable at all. Um, what the difference is is the things that are not dictated by the game, and so like you know you don't have to have a little pizza circle nomming all of these uh, dots. You can. You could also have you know a dragon or or, or who knows what. Um, and if you're doing a spaceship game, like you want to have something that's spaceship shaped, and like the little URL, the UFO in the bottom right of the the meteors game, you know it's it's a UFO. Um, there's and it looks a little bit different than the, the Asteroids one as well. So it's kind of just um, you know, what is dictated by the gameplay. And here, if you're defining it as a spaceship game and you have something that looks like a spaceship shooting something that looks like space rocks, um, there's not a lot left. And then in the Pac-Man case, the, I think the, the really big difference is that there didn't have to be ghosts and there didn't have to be specifically the Pac-Man character. And my theory is that when you're in the 8-bit world, you, the differences are going to be very fewer because you're kind of restricted yeah. by the world that you're in. And, case law that came out in that era is interesting for that reason. Um, but maybe if it, there was that same 
case today, I don't know that it would be it would come out the same. But that's just my own opinion. Yeah. Yeah, so another way of looking at that is essentially if, if you can only do so many things because you have very limited memory and your computer can only make five sounds, the scope of what you can do in a creative fashion is very limited. And then nowadays, like if you build a, a giant, massive video game with like really cool textures and, and music and stuff, there's a lot of expressive room there. All right, time for a couple more. I think we've been neglecting to repeat the question, but the question yeah. is, go ahead. Oh, uh, the, the question was. Um, uh, Fair use of video game reuse. And I'm not yes. familiar with the blue versus red because I'm old, but. Um, it's a little bit older. <laughs> it's, it's actually a little bit older, John. Come on. Yeah. They made, um, Those Halo characters. Yeah, so guys made, like, put a story behind Halo. And they were using like the Halo models story. and stuff as sort of like actors and characters in like a CGI game. Video. So, so Mark knows more. So I, I know more about this, um, but as as someone who has uh, read many many fair use cases, I cannot think of anything um, focused on the idea of sort of using game assets as a media to tell a different story um, off the top of my head. So, not that I'm aware of. Thank you. Okay, maybe one la last yes. question. Last question. I think it's definitely true that we don't have uh, uh, the largest physical video game because we get identifying materials, as Mark no. was saying. But not necessarily the actual physical Right, right. And, and think of why, right? We're the Copyright Office. If we had to get the Atari 2600, the Commodore 64, the Nintendo 64, and all these different consoles for all the, the um, examiners, we'd just be playing video games all day. Um. Which would be a shame, which would be a, a, an absolute shame, and we would both be very sad about that situation. But you know, it is a challenge getting you know, these updated versions, but what, what is true and the things that you know, we can see is videos, and maybe the change from, from VHS to DVD or just an up uploaded um, you know, visual file that's on our computers, that might not be too pro problematic, but staying up to date with not only initially the, the consoles, for example, but the updates to Windows and having the right version, it's, it, is, it is a challenge. And it's a challenge for preservation a lot, too. And if you're interested in preservation, there is a great panel tomorrow on that. Well, the Library of Congress and the Conservation Center called Pepper we gave a gift of 3,000 games last year. So now they have 6,000, but I think the Museum of Play yes. in Rochester, New York, yeah. really has the largest collection in the United States. It, it, for those of us uh, who might not have, we've been remiss in repeating comments and questions, but uh, it sounds like the museum, of, we do have a lot uh, through donation uh, from ESA and their member companies, uh, but also the Museum of Play made in San Francisco and a couple others do have significant collections uh, that are not part of the library. All right. All right. Well, I think I with some, that, some natural music, right? we are. Huh? Huh? Nice. There we go. That's good. That's good. Welcome to the happy with that.